Good afternoon, good evening to our friends and colleagues. and um, Welcome to our CWPAMS2 virtual shared learning webinar. Next slide, please. My name is Nikki Darcy, and I am the technical project manager for the integration and use of microbiology data workstream for CWPAMS. Next slide. Thank you. Today is the second of our quarterly webinars, which we are running as part of our Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. We are running a series of eight webinars focused on strengthening the capacity of health partnerships through sharing good practices, tools and resources that can support effective implementation of the CWPAMS2 projects. As our CWPAMS2 program progresses and your partnerships and projects develop, we'll be reaching out to you to get involved to share your learning from the health partnerships. We cannot host shared learning webinars without the input from the people who are bringing our CWPAMS program to life across our eight African countries and the UK. Today, I am delighted to be hosting our second webinar, Introduction to Basic Clinical Microbiology. This is the first time that the CWPAMS program has incorporated laboratory data and processes into its project plans, and we're really excited to expand the scope of our AMS activities to include this vital resource and the teams who generate the data. We are aware, however, that resources and staff can be limited in some facilities, which hinders the use of the microbiology lab in informing clinical practice. The aim of our work stream is to try to understand this work in the context of all of your facilities and to get to know how we can support you in integrating lab personnel into your AMS committees and teams and how to integrate and use microbiology data in clinical practice. Unfortunately, it's currently beyond our remit to secure supplies or equipment through CWPAMS, but we have heard this is an issue from a number of you, and we're taking this up with other grant providers who may be able to offer support. We've generated a survey to send to the microbiology contacts at each of your facilities, and we'll send this out to you soon. Please bear in mind that there are no right or wrong answers here, so please do encourage people to complete this openly and honestly. We hope to arrange a follow-up meeting with some of you on video calls to discuss your survey responses further and we will be in touch. For today, we have some quick questions that we would like to ask you to respond to on the poll that we'll show on your screen. Um, if you could just answer these, this will help us to understand how you'd like to work with us. Um, hopefully you have the poll popped up now and we'll give you a few moments to complete that. Next slide, please. So here is the agenda for today's webinar. We've got quite a lot of content to get through, but hope you will have some time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. We'll be monitoring the chat throughout, so please do feel free to use this to ask us questions and we hope to respond in real time. Next slide. Some housekeeping. So this session is being recorded and we will provide you with details of how to access the recording at the end of the webinar. If you haven't already done so, um, please could you also take a few minutes to complete the pre-session survey via the link in the chat. That should pop up soon. And the next slide, please. Um, so please also keep your microphones muted throughout the presentations. And if we do open up to questions, please raise your hand and then you'll be invited to turn on your microphone and camera. Thank you, next slide. So we have two excellent speakers joining us today. Uh, firstly, we have Dr. Gina Driscoll, a consultant microbiologist and AMS lead at Buckinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust here in the UK. Jean has been a consultant microbiologist since 1995 and was Director of Infection Prevention and Control for 10 years. She has an undergraduate degree from University College Cork, a Master's in Clinical Microbiology and is a member of the Royal College of Pathologists and became a Fellow of the College in, 20, uh, in 2002. Next slide, please. Also joining us today is Dr. Louise Sweeney, a consultant medical microbiologist at Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Louise has specialist knowledge of infection and hematology and transplant patients, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, and the approach to clinical management of multidrug resistant gram negative infections. Louise is a council member of the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. So now I will hand over to Dr. Gina Driscoll to begin our webinar. Next slide, please. Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session. I'm just going to introduce a few basic principles and then hand over to Louise for more detail about um, the use of the lab and antibiotic testing. So next slide, please. So microbiology is the study of microbes. And as you know, our bodies contain numerous species of microbes, which are part of the normal flora. 
particularly the mouth, the pharynx and the large intestine. So bodies become colonized shortly after birth and within one day of life, the large intestine and the mouth will be colonized with a variety of normal bacteria, such as Staph aureus, Haemophilus and Pneumococcus in the respiratory tract and E. coli and anaerobes in the large intestine. Next slide. So I think it's really important to know the difference between colonization with bacteria and infection, because if you um, have colonized bacteria, these do not need to be treated with antibiotics. Whereas if there is an infection, obviously antibiotics may be indicated. So as I say, the body li lives in symbiosis with lots of normal microorganisms, um, and these this is called colonization. But if, if an inflammatory response ensues, then this is so-called infection or disease. So colonization is just the presence of bacteria and diseases where there's an inflammatory response due to those bacteria. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd mention a few clinical syndromes which arise when infections uh, result from infection with bacteria. So, for example, in the upper respiratory tract, you can have infection of the sinuses with organisms such as pneumococcus, haemophilus, and moraxella. Um, in the throat, you can have bacterial infection due with group A strep, or you can have viral infections, or there can be infections due to other bacteria, bacterial pathogens such as strep pneumonia or haemophilus. Next slide, please. And in the lower respiratory tract, um, we can have the syndromes of bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and pneumonia. Um, pneumonia would be the most severe of these clinical syndromes, um, which can be caused by viruses, including COVID and bacteria, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, and other bacteria, such as Haemophilus, Staph aureus, and some gram-negative organisms. Next slide, please. So in the urinary tract, we can have urinary tract infections, which can affect the upper urinary tract or the lower urinary tract. The upper urinary tract would involve infections of the kidney, which is pyelonephritis, or the ureters, which is ureteritis. And these would be characterized by flank pain, high fever, dark or small foul smelling urine. And then the lower urinary tract, which involves infections of the bladder and urethra, which really causes cystitis. And these symptoms would be more of dysuria, frequency of urine, um, and it's more common in women. Next slide, please. And obviously you can get infections of the skin, such as cellulitis, which is shown here, which is a reddening of the skin. Um, it's a good idea to mark the edge of the rash so that you can monitor the progress of the infection. And this can be a serious uh, bacterial infection. Next slide, please. So the infections of wounds can arise from Staph aureus infections, beta hemolytic streptococcal infections, especially group A strep, and some gram-negative organisms and um, anaerobes. Uh, again, sometimes bacteria can be colonizing the skin, and in this case, they do not need to be treated with antibiotics. But if there is sign of clinical infection, then antibiotics may be indicated. Next slide, please. And obviously, in diarrhea can have infectious causes, which can be non-inflammatory or inflammatory. The non-inflammatory include causes such as viruses like norovirus or rotavirus, which are quite very common, or protozoa such as giardia or cryptosporidium, or bacterial causes, um, including cholera. And the inflammatory diarrhea, cytomegalovirus is quite uncommon, but amoebiasis can be a cause of diarrhea. And then there are various bacterial causes, including the common Campylobacter, Shigella, and Salmonella causes. Next slide, please. So um, it's really important um, when sending samples to the microbiology lab to follow some general good principles. First of all, only send samples if there's a, a definite evidence of infection. Ensure the sample and any forms are correctly labeled with the patient details, date of birth, any hospital numbers. Um, then give relevant clinical information. For
for example, if there had been travel to another country, if the patient is on an antibiotic, if the patient has, a pen, has an antibiotic allergy, for example, these can be helpful for the laboratory when they're doing the testing. Avoid contaminating any samples, especially blood cultures. Make sure there's a sufficient volume of a specimen to ensure tests can be performed, for example, with urine samples and stool samples. Ensure the sample reaches the laboratory as soon as possible, usually within half an hour of it being taken. If there's going to be a delay, then the sample should be stored in the, at the correct temperature, either refrigerated or kept at room temperature, depending on the sample. If the sample is particularly urgent, it's a good idea to let the lab know that you're sending it and to let them know how you can be contacted after the result is available. And as I say, it's quite important to make sure that the samples are kept at correct temperatures before they reach the lab. Next slide, please. So this is all part of diagnostic stewardship, which is really a, a cycle from the clinician assessing the patient, making the diagnosis, sending the right samples in the right way, making sure they arrive at the right time and that the lab does the right tests and um, chooses the right antibiotic sensitivity testing to do and then reports in a timely man manner so that the correct decisions can be made by the clinicians as regards choice of antibiotics. Next slide. So um, it's important, as I say, to collect samples properly for urine samples if you're suspecting a urinary tract infection. It's important to use a midstream urine sample rather than say the first sample um, passed. Um, in all of these cases, hands should be washed before taking samples. Often gloves should be worn as well. Um, as I say, it should be the midstream uh, sample that's collected. So the, uh, the first sample should be discarded and then halfway through urination, uh, the container should be filled and then the, the, the lid should be put onto the container and this should all be done in a very clean way to avoid any contamination of the specimen. Next sample, next slide. Uh, so for taking uh, samples from patients with catheters in place, urinary catheters, it's important to use a sampling port, not to take the sample from the drainage bag because um, this will not provide a good indication of the organism causing the infection because there could be urine hanging around in the drainage bag for some time and there can be contamination of the bag. And it's really important to wash your hands, as I say, and use gloves uh, before taking the sample to avoid contamination. Next slide, please. Um, as regards sending sputum samples, it's really important to send a good sample of sputum, which is usually quite thick and maybe yellow or green, rather than just a salivary sample, which won't contain any bacteria. So uh, if somebody has got a chest infection and they're coughing up a yellow or green sputum, then it's important to send a sample of this. But if they can't cough anything up that's significant, then there isn't really any point in sending a sample to the laboratory. The next slide, please. For stool samples, again, it's important to get a good volume of, of stool sample, about usually a third to a half of one of the containers of, of uh, stool samples. Um, and it's really important to wash your hands before and after taking the samples. Um, soap and water should be used uh, because organisms such as norovirus and clostridium are resistant to um, alcohol gel. So it's good old fashioned soap and water is what you should use when dealing with any of these samples. Next slide, please. For wound swabs, um, it's important to try and get rid of any surface um, contamination. So you should what you should clean the surface first with normal saline, and then swab the base of the wound. Again, as I mentioned, and at the bottom of the slide, the wound swabs swabs should only be taken when there's good clinical evidence of infection. So not just because there's a wound with no surrounding cellulitis or no signs of infection, there's no point in sending a, a wound swab then because what we'll get is colonizing flora rather than any uh, pathogenic bacteria. Next slide, please. For blood cultures, this is a particularly important to avoid contamination of the samples. 
So we, what we would recommend is, first of all, washing your hands then cleaning the site of the vene puncture using a, maybe a, a, an alcohol wipe with chlorhexidine. Um, and then it should be the surface of the, uh, the skin that you're using should be um, cleaned for about 30 seconds. Um, and then the uh, remove the plastic cap of each blood culture bottle and the actual rubber stopper should be decontaminated and allowed to dry. Then put on gloves after that. Um, the, and then use either a syringe or directly into a blood culture by a vacuum caner, tainer, caner, tainer system. Um, and if it's drawn into a syringe, the blood should be uh, put into the vials without changing needles. In the past, there was this idea that you should change needles between bottles, but that actually um, introduces a risk of contamination. And if you're taking lots of of blood tests, you should always do the blood culture test first before uh, taking blood for, say, full blood count or urea or, or electrolytes. Um, and obviously, this, this, the bottles should be labelled at the bedside, and the samples should be kept at room temperature. They shouldn't; they should never be refrigerated until they're sent to the lab. They should be sent as quickly as possible to the lab. Um, within four hours of being taken, they should have reached the lab and be put on the, uh, be analysed by the lab. And the, the procedure should be documented well in the patient's medical records. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just um, what we use in the UK. We use two blood culture bottles per set, an aerobic and an anaerobic bottle. And it's important to put 10 mils of blood into each bottle. Um, and in order to facilitate that, it might be an idea to mark the, uh, the volume of the bottle at the side of the bottle. Um, just mark it with a line so that you can see that you've put enough blood into the blood culture bottle. Because if you don't have enough, then that really reduces the sensitivity of testing and you may get false negative results. Thanks very much. Um, I think I'm handing over now to Louise. Hello, thank you very much, Jean. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am going to now talk about actually what we do in the laboratory and how that can make a real difference to the management of patients. Before I do that, can I just remind everybody um, if you can, if you haven't already, to fill out the poll um, that was introduced at the beginning of the session. We have relaunched it, so you should be able to fill it in if you haven't had the opportunity yet. So let's start by talking about the microbiology laboratory. So there is great variability from lab to lab in terms of what kind of resource, what kind of tests are provided. Even within the United Kingdom, from lab to lab, there can be quite vast variability in the available tests. But some things are pretty standard, and that's what we like to call of bench microbiology. So microbiology, unlike some other pathology specialties, has continued despite the, the development of newer, exciting, faster tests to still very much rely on basic principles. And it's important that we remember these and continue to use them because actually they provide us with an awful lot of information and can be used wherever you are um, even if you, you don't have a huge amount of resource, there's still a lot of information you can get from some very basic microbiology principles. So I'm going to start by talking about microscopy. Um, microscopy, one of my favourite bits, I have to say, of, of bench microbiology is, of course, something we use in order to visualise bacterial and fungal cells if they are present in a clinical specimen. And the how this helps us is because between bacteria and fungi different stains will be retained and lost which is based on the structure of the cell wall and we have some examples on the slide here and you can see gram positive gram negative there are differences mycobacteria fungi some very clear differences in the cell wall and this provides us with some very initial identification information um, so it can help to guide us initially in terms of diagnosis and empirical antimicrobial therapy and can also help to guide what further testing 
we need to do within the laboratory. So let's look at some examples here. So gram negative compared to gram positive, we're, we're going to look in a minute at the gram procedure, but this is a staining technique that has been in existence for a very, very long time. And it's based on the fact that there are key structural differences between gram positive bacteria and gram negative. So when we talk about gram positive, we're thinking about organisms like staphylococci for gram negative, thinking about organisms like E. coli. And the difference here is that gram positive bacteria have this lovely thick petroglycan cell wall, which helps to really retain stains when they're um, exposed to them. Whereas gram negative bacteria have a much thinner wall and additionally an outer membrane. So they can actually lose stains quite quickly, but will take up counter stains. Next slide, please. And that's the basis of the gram staining procedure. Um, so we get a, a sample, for example, positive blood culture, drop on the slide, heat fix it, and then apply an initial stain. And often uh, the first stain applied is going to be crystal violet, so we get a lovely purple colour there. We then need to apply something like iodine, um, which just uh, helps in the process of, of keeping that stain absorbed for the gram positives. But then we want to see whether the bacterial cell is going to lose the stain. So we apply alcohol wash. And if we have gram negative bacteria in the sample, this, that gram positive crystal violet stain will be lost, uh, sorry, will be retained. But if we have a gram negative, that stain will be lost. And then we will apply a counter stain of a different color. So saffronin, for example. And this allows very quickly to distinguish on microscopy between gram pos positive bi bacteria and gram negative bacteria. So we've already differentiated from that sample what sort of bacteria we have. And then next thing, uh, next slide, please. We can get some further information by looking at the cells and looking at the morphology. So the shape as well as the staining and how they arrange themselves. And we have the next slide, please. And I've put some examples here because that's often the easiest way, isn't it, to show how this uh, particular test can be really helpful in providing us information. So here's some examples of common gram positive and gram negative bacteria and how just through microscopy you can identify them. Um, it's not a, a firm diagnosis, but together with clinical information, it's certainly leading you towards the correct path of the identity of your pathogen. So, for example, let's look at our gram positive organisms that have retained that, start, that stain. There are clear differences. Staphylococci, streptococci, both stain as gram positive, lovely purple colors, but morphologically look very different. Staphylococci clump together like bunches of grapes. Streptococci prefer to form chains or sometimes pairs. So very quickly, if you have a patient who, for example, presents with cellulitis, their blood culture is positive, you do the gram staining technique, you've already got a very good idea of whether this infection is due to staphylococcus or streptococcus. There are other differences in morphology that you can pick up on. For example, the presence of spores. The example of clostridia, we can see those spores in the middle, which are staining as pink rather than purple. And with gram negatives, you can get some really nice differences in the morphology, which can be very classical. So Campylobacter has the appearance of a seagull. It's that lovely wave form. Vibrio, nice curved rods, very distinct from your usual gram-negative pathogens that you see like E. coli or Klebsiella. Next slide, please. However, not all bacteria will stain using the gram stain method. Some don't stain very well at all because of differences in their cell wall. Mycoplasma, for example, doesn't have a cell wall, so it's not going to take up gram, st gram staining. Other organisms like mycobacteria have a very different structure because they have a very lipid rich cell wall. So the usual stains don't penetrate. 
So you have to use a, a process called acid alcohol fast staining. There are other microscopy methods as well, such as dark field microscopy. So lots of different ways that you can visualize organisms. If you have, for example, a blood culture that's flagged positive, and you initially start with gram staining techniques and you can't see anything in that sample, along with the clinical details, that may trigger a thought as to, well, maybe this is something that doesn't stain by gram staining. Maybe I need to think about organisms like mycobacteria or mycoplasma. Next slide, please. Fungi also can be visualized by microscopy. Earlier on, one of the examples I showed of gram-positive staining was Candida albicans. So Candida will stain using that method, but there are other methods available, particularly when we're thinking about our moulds. So there's um, one of my personal favourites, which is the uh, Scotch tape microscopy, uh, where when you have a growth on a plate of a lovely mould, you can very simply use a bit of uh, sellotape, sticky side down to... Uh, press over that colony so you get some lovely bits of hyphae on there that you can then stain and look at under the microscope and it, the nice thing about that is it keeps those structures intact it doesn't damage them so you can get these really nice views um, of the hyphae and, and other parts of the fungus which can help with identification. Indier ink stains used to show capsules and calcifloor white, uh, which uses fluorochrome, again, used UV microscopy for this, but helps to show those structures of fungi more. Now, of course, we may not have access to all of these things, but there's a range of methods there, as you can see, to help us visualize any fungal uh, colonies that we have in our cultures. Next slide, please. So then let's talk about culture because microscopy can be done directly from a sample such as blood uh, that's been taken for culture. Um, but it's not very useful if you've got samples that are non-sterile where you're going to expect to see lots of bacteria there. So what we want to be able to achieve is to get something in culture, get a pure growth that we can then pick out the relevant organisms and do some more identification work on. And that's where culture is really helpful. So culture is the use of artificial media to encourage the growth and therefore isolation of microbes, which may be pathogenic in our patients. And there are lots of different type of media available, liquid, solid. Here in the UK, a long time ago, we used to make our own agar plates. Um, that's because of the volume has, has very much gone away and we now buy them in from elsewhere, but it is still something that you can do if you've got the available resources. And there are different types of media. You can have non-selective media, which are just encouraging the growth of anything that's in that sample, um, or more selective media which allows you, because of the nutrients involved, the chemicals that are present and antimicrobials that may be in the agar, to allow particular organisms that you are interested in to grow through. The method of inoculation of your plates is really important. And here is um, uh, an example of what we're taught to use in the UK. And the reason it's important is that what you want to do is try and get single colonies. And so spreading out your test isolate across the plate should allow you to do that because it's much better and easier to work with single colonies, particularly if your culture may be mixed. Next slide, please. The incubation conditions for your culture are very, very important because Different microbes like to grow in different atmospheres or different temperatures. Crucially, also the time that you allow the organisms to incubate for is important. If you read a plate too early, you may not get the results that you want. If you leave a plate for too long, you may get unnecessary overgrowth that then shadows or clouds the important organisms. So there are key things we need to think about. The plates that we're using, so the media, whether we're using selective, non-selective, what sort of organisms we are interested in, which be based on the clinical sample that we've received. 
what sort of conditions those pathogenic organisms we're worried about need to grow and at what time we need to be reading those cultures. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, so selective media, I just wanted to show you some examples of that. Obviously, some labs may not have access to all of these different types of media. Um, some may be able to make their own. Uh, these are examples, particularly for enteric flora, where if you have a stool sample, of course, you're going to have a lot of bacteria in that sample. But you want to be able to select out the ones that you're worried about in terms of causing infection. So this is an example of where selective media can be really, really helpful to help prevent growth of anything you're not interested in and promote growth of those pathogens you are interested in. And this, again, all helps to identify the organisms causing the problems for the patient. I always think about microbiology, even more so than other branches of medicine, being a bit like being a detective and trying to put the evidence together to find your culprit. Next slide, please. Once you have a growth on a plate, um, you have microscopy, which can give you information, but there are other things as well that you can use and other tests to help identify further, even to species level, the organism that you have. Initially, just looking at the culture plate and looking at the colonies themselves, the colours, the shape, whether the colonies have caused any hemolysis on the plate, if you're using um, blood agar, Looking at whether they're mucoid colonies or dry colonies, all of this provides you with information, but there are other tests you can do. Biochemical tests work on the basis of knowing what bacteria produce in terms of enzymes, for example, um, and can be used to very quickly and easily identify an organism. So, for example, you've got um, a mucoid looking colony on a plate it's a sample that's been, uh, say it's a urine culture. So you're thinking you've probably got a gram negative organism causing the problem. The most common organism to cause that type of infection would be E. coli. So a very simple test would be something called the indole test because E. coli, other, like, other than, um, with the exception, sorry, E. coli uh, is indole positive Whereas other coliforms or enterobacteriales, if we're going to use the proper name, like Klebsiella, for example, are not. So immediately you've got some additional information about your identification. For Staphylococci, Staphylococcus aureus produces coagulase. The other Staphylococci, which tend to be less pathogenic, things like Staphylococcus epidermidis, usually just contaminants when we get them in most cultures, do not. So a simple coagulase test can differentiate that growth on the plate between Staph aureus and another type of Staphylococcus. For a long time, and I always really enjoyed using these, um, there were some really nice kits, the API kits, that allowed you to do a whole host of biochemical tests very quickly in one go and that provide you an idea of the organism, including to species level. So um, API stands for analytical profile index and it's uh, the, the little strip you can see at the bottom with the different colors, which contain uh, different types of media, um, dehydrated media that have chemically defined compositions. You add your solution containing your test isolate to it and look for reactions, which are usually color mediated reactions. This produces a score, um, which you can then submit to a database or maybe from a book, which then because of a wide database of organism identities will tell you what the organism is. So this is quite a rapid, nice test to do if you have access to this bit of kit. And then in terms of media, so the agar that we're growing our organisms on, there are increasingly uh, more and more chromogenic agar. So agar that when you grow a particular organism, the colonies will come out as a particular color. So what we've got a picture of there is something called brilliance agar, which is used when you have, for example, urine uh, that you want to culture to see if there's a pathogen. E. coli, 
colonies will be pink. And immediately you've got an identification. Um, add that along with an indole positive test and you know you've got E. coli. Very quick, very simple. There are also serological methods for identification, which are based on particular antigens that may be present within the cell wall of certain bacteria. And latex particles coated with an antibody, when applied to a sample of the bacteria, you'll get agglutination. Again, a very quick and simple test if you have access to those resources. Next slide, please. So um, an example of how this would work we used the example of cellulitis before, didn't we? So a blood, a blood culture is sent. The clinical details say cellulitis. That blood culture is incubated. We get growth. We do gram staining on a sample of that blood. And we see gram positive organisms, lovely and round, um, clumping together, which immediately tells us that this is staphylococcus. Now, cellulitis, common cause of, of that, Staphylococcus aureus. So we set up our culture plates. And again, this is a blood agar, very typical appearance of Staphylococcus aureus on a blood agar plate. You can even see a bit of hemolysis in the background, which again would be typical. We think this is Staphylococcus aureus. We want to do some further testing. We know Staphylococcus aureus produces coagulase. Other staphylococci do not. So we can do coagulase tests, either a latex test or a, a free unbound coagulase test. The tests are positive and immediately we have our diagnosis. So that's how these methods, using very simple bench microbiology, can provide you with important results to guide the management of your patients. Next slide, please. Of course, there are other systems and it's very variable as to what people have access to. Some of the tests that we've talked about in terms of um, identification, but also susceptibility testing can be done using automated systems. And I've put uh, on there pictures of two such systems which are very widely used throughout the world, the BD Phoenix and the BioMario Vitec. Two, and they have automated rule bases and databases that analyze that biochemical data and susceptibility data to give you an identity plus susceptibility results. You still need to incubate the samples over a prolonged period of time. So it's not rapid. Um, it's an additional day on top of culturing your organism, but it does give you those results. Increasingly in many areas of the world, uh, people are looking and using proteonic techniques like matrix assisted laser desorption, ionization, time of flight mass spectrometry, which is quite a, a mouthful. So we all refer to it as mold it off. And this is where uh, it's actually looking at um, instead of biochemical markers that will identify the organism, it's looking at particular proteins and using those proteins uh, in mass spectrometry to produce an identification. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just an example of, of sorry, if we go back, um, you can see an example of, of what you get. So you get peaks according to the presence of particular proteins, um, and that gives you an ID, again, a vast database, which is regularly being updated. But of course, these methods, they do cost money and resource. So it's not necessarily available to everybody. Molditoff is certainly much faster in terms of the results. You can get a result within a few hours, so same day um, from a colony and with the right kits, also direct from positive blood cultures. Next slide, please. And of course, we have to talk about molecular techniques increasingly being used in bacteriology um, for a long time. It was mainly the domain of virology, but we are now catching up. And this allows much more rapid identification and in some instances can be used in a syndromic way. So, for example, the BioFi produced by BioMario, you can put a sample of CSF, for example, or blood and you do a rapid syndromic PCR, which will identify key pathogens that you're looking for. They are expensive. They require continuous resource but they are quick. 
The downside is you will not be able to identify anything that the system is not programmed to look for. So anything that you don't have um, the, uh, the particular reagents to look for. So any new or emerging bacteria that may be causing a problem will not be identified by these agents. Next slide, please. So let's move on to antibiotics, because, of course, alongside identification, we want to talk about susceptibility testing. Very quickly, a classification of antibiotics. How do we classify them? You'll be aware there are lots of different groups of antibiotics and they can be classified in various ways. The most common way is through their mechanism of action. So whether they work on cell walls, um, such as beta-lactam antibiotics, your glycopeptides, such as vancomycin, whether they work directly on DNA or RNA synthesis, such as fluoroquinolones, whether they work on the ribosomes, and then you can further divide that according to which subunit. And this is just a really nice diagrammatic in, uh, example of that. Next slide, please. We have to mention about the beta-lactams, the biggest group of antibiotics that we have available to us. And you can see there are multiple different uh, beta-lactams available, some of which you may have access to, some of which you won't, some of which are used regularly in clinical treatment, others that are not. So if I went through this list, I would be able to pick off um, a number that we have access into the, into in the UK, but also a huge number that we don't have access to. But they are subdivided according to, again, differences um, within their molecular makeup. Um, so, for example, the cephalosporins, really important to note that the cephalosporins are divided up into different generations, which accord with their spectrum of activity. Next slide, please. Antibiotics have also been classified according to whether they are bactericidal or bacteriostatic in their action. Essentially, what this means is bactericidal organisms, as the name implies, uh, bactericidal antibiotics rather, kill the bacterial cell. Whereas bacteriostatic antibiotics slow the growth of the bacteria, but do not kill them. And for a long time, it was felt that bacteriostatic antibiotics were inferior to bactericidal. There was a, a very nice paper that came out uh, a number of years ago now, I think it was 2018, uh, in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which was titled Busting the Myth of Static Versus Sidal. And this is a systematic literature review looking at randomized controlled trials which found that the vast majority of those trials, about 49 out of 56, found no significant difference between the uh, outcomes of patients when you use bactericidal versus bacteriostatic drugs. The main characteristics that are important in successful treatment are optimal dosing, pharmacokinetics, and tissue penetration. Next slide, please. With all these vast antibiotics, knowing how they work, um, knowing uh, what their classification is, is important. But of course, the most important thing for us as clinicians is their spectrum of activity because they are all different. So another way in which we will classify antibiotics is according to that spectrum. Do they have activity against gram-positive organisms, gram-negative organisms? Do they have activity against anaerobes? This uh, table here is very good. It's not exhaustive, but it shows some of the common susceptibility patterns of commonly used antimicrobials against significant pathogens. And it's really, really important for all of us, both within microbiology and outside, to know some very basic um, antibiotic spectrum of the antibiotics that we use on a regular basis. Next slide, please. So that brings us to antibiotic susceptibility testing, which is my second, well, it's actually joint favourite with microscopy part of uh, microbiology. So antimicrobial susceptibility testing, of course, the main function is to tell us how best to treat our patients. We have a pathogen. What is it susceptible to? What is the best agent for, for getting a good outcome for our patient? It can also be used to help with the identity of an organism. 
um, if you're aware of what the anticipated spectrum of activity is. However, golden rule, you cannot truly and reliably interpret susceptibility testing unless you know the identity of the organism that you are testing. AST, as, as we often refer to it as, is guided by a number of very important points. The anticipated susceptibility profiles of specific pathogens. So are they intrinsically resistant to certain antibiotics? Should they, in the main, be susceptible to other antibiotics? It's also guided by the availability of clinical breakpoints, by local and national empirical treatment guidelines. So we want to test antimicrobials we have access to and that we use. And so therefore antibiotic availability is also important. Next slide, please. There are different ways of testing antimicrobial susceptibility. The gold standard is microbroth dilution. Um, and this gives us something called the minimum inhibitory concentration, the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial agent that inhibits the visible in vitro growth of a microbe. And you can see, um, hopefully, that a nice sort of diagrammatic representation of what that looks like. You're looking for the, um, the absence of growth on your agar plate or the smallest amount of growth at different concentrations of the antibiotic. The minimum bactericidal concentration is the lowest concentration needed to kill, and therefore get a completely clear no growth um, at a particular concentration of antibiotic. And this can be done with agar as well as broth, and it is the gold standard. Next slide, please. However, for ease, um, the main way of testing for many, many years in diagnostic, busy diagnostic laboratories was disk diffusion testing, uh, where you have a suspension, a standardized suspension of your organism that you then inoculate um, an agar plate with, so a lovely lawn that covers the plate, apply the antibiotic discs that you want to test, incubate, check the plate the next day, and you're looking for a zone of inhibition, which tells you whether you've got activity against that organism or not. There is some variability in this, in that for certain antibiotics that may have very large molecules, you're going to get much slower diffusion through agar than you are for antibiotics with small, that are smaller molecules. And so just having a big zone to an antibiotic doesn't tell you necessarily that it's susceptible. There are um, differences uh, to be applied. So for example, vancomycin is a very big molecule. So you're unlikely to get very big zone sizes, but a zone size that is much smaller compared to, to for example, penicillin may still be a susceptible zone size. And that's where you need clinical breakpoints. Next slide, please. So susceptibility breakpoints are um, a, a chosen concentration of an antibiotic, which defines whether a back species of bacteria is susceptible or resistant to that antibiotic. When we talk about zone sizes, it's the size of the zone. So if the breakpoint um, you have a breakpoint, which will be in millimetres. And if that zone size is larger than that breakpoint, it's susceptible. If it's smaller, it's resistant. Other way around, the minimum inhibitory concentration, you want the lowest number possible, not a high number. So anything below that breakpoint is susceptible. Different antibiotics um, for different bugs, we call them the drug bug combination may have different breakpoints depending on the type of infection being treated. So for example, meningitis compared to non-meningitis, because one of the key elements of determining antimicrobial susceptibility is the penetration of the antibiotic to the site that you are trying to reach. So when breakpoints are put together, it's based on microbiological data, 
It's based on pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data and also clinical study results. So the MIC, the zone size is really important, but so is the type of infection that you're treating and where you're trying to get the antibiotic. Not all bacteria or drug bug combinations will have breakpoints. And in those situations, it's often uh, decisions are based on whether there's clinical experience of using a certain antibiotic in the treatment of a certain infection. Next slide, please. There are um, two main clinical breakpoint guidelines that are used throughout the world, and it varies from place to place what people use. One is American, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute College of American Pathologists, or the CLSI, breakpoints. And um, the other, which I will show a slide of in a moment, is the European version. Um, now, both are moving more and more towards a very individualized approach to susceptibility testing. And that means looking not just at whether the organism shows susceptibility to an antibiotic, but really taking on board things like the concentration of antibiotic achieved at different sites in the body. So you will see that the traditional susceptible intermediate resistance are being replaced with categories such as susceptible dose dependent, which means you've got a much higher likelihood of clinical success if you use higher doses. This may be for particular drug bug combinations and certainly for different sites of infection. So susceptibility testing is becoming more complicated and that is because of an acknowledgement about variability in methodology, but also how drugs are metabolized and cleared by patients. Next slide, please. This is the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing. This is the one that we use in the United Kingdom. Um, much like CLSI, it has some different categories which are based on something called exposure. And exposure is just what we've been talking about. It's about how the antibiotic is administered how long you're infusing it for, what the metabolism and excretion, excretion of the agent is, as well as the organism itself. Next slide, please. So when setting up your antimicrobial susceptibility testing, you have to take on board what bugs you're testing, what the susceptibility profile you anticipate should be, what antimicrobials you have available to you, but also what sort of resistance may you see. So it's important to know about your local epidemiology. Resistance detection, it's important to have indicator antibiotics. So these are antibiotics that will be able to highlight the presence of a particular resistance mechanism of concern. For example, extended spectrum beta-lactamase production in Enterobacteriales, which would very significantly change the antibiotics your organism is susceptible to and therefore you should use in treatment of your patient. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Um, here are some organisms, some antibiotics that are commonly used throughout the world and their expected susceptibility profiles. So you'll see Klebsiella pneumoniae should never be amoxicillin susceptible because it produces something called TEM beta-lactamase, T-E-M. So it will never ever be amoxicillin susceptible. It will also not be susceptible to agents like vancomycin that act on gram-positive organisms only. Klebsiella is a gram-negative organism. And metronidazole, which has activity against anaerobes only. So this is an expected susceptibility profile. This is the sort of thing you would expect to see. Um, we've got some other examples there, Staphylococcus, Enterococcus, very specific intrinsic susceptibility. Pseudomonas, only those agents with activity against pseudomonas, what we call the anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, are going to show any susceptibility here. And Bacteroides, an anaerobe, um, in the main, we can rely on metronidazole susceptibility, bit variable to some other antibiotics. Next slide, please. However, some of these organisms can develop or acquire resistance, and the use of indicator antibiotics will help to demonstrate that to us. 
Um, and as you can see, if we look at the example of an ESBL producing E. coli, usually E. coli will be susceptible to a broad range of beta-lactam antibiotics, including cephalosporins. But if it's an ESBL producer, it's going to be resistant. And indicator antibiotics like cefpidoxine, although not as completely specific as we would like it to be, certainly gives you an indication that we've got ESBL production, coupled with resistance to third generation cephalosporins like keftriaxone and kefataxine. If we don't test these agents, we won't pick up that resistance. and We may treat the patient with the wrong antibiotic. Next slide, please. So which brings me on to antimicrobial resistance. We're all very, very aware of increasing antimicrobial resistance, particularly within those bacteria of significant pathogenic importance. Now, antibiotic resistance very simply is an antibiotic not being uh, effective against a particular organism. We all have bacteria that will be resistant to certain types of antibiotic, intrinsically so. What happens when we use antibiotics is that we will select out any bacteria that are not <clears throat> susceptible to it. And that can allow those resistant bacteria to multiply, to flourish, which then facilitates spread of antibiotic resistance. And in our hospital patients, where bacteria can be shed into the environment through infected wounds, for example, through coughing, um, through diarrhea, that antibiotic resistance can be spread within the environment or on the hands of healthcare staff to other vulnerable patients. Next slide, please. There are multiple, there are four main uh, mechanisms of resistance that we worry about. Impermeability, so antibiotics not being able to get into the cell. Antibiotics being pumped out of the cell by efflux. Modification of the antibiotic target. Um, so with beta-lactams, they target penicillin binding proteins in the cell wall. If those proteins are modified by a mutation, the beta-lactam cannot bind to them and exert its effect. And of course, inactivating enzymes that break down, that hydrolyze our antibiotics, rendering them ineffective. Now, some of these mechanisms in some of these bacteria will be intrinsic, which means that organism will never, ever, ever be susceptible to certain antibiotics. For example, stenotrophomonas. Um, this is an antibiotic that has intrinsic resistance to a number of different antibiotics including carbapenems. And that's because it produces an enzyme called a carbapenemase, and it will always produce that enzyme. It doesn't really transmit um, to other uh, stenotrophomonas because they all have it. It's intrinsic, it's built in. What we worry about is the resistance that can be passed to other bacteria within the same species and even different species. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of some of those antibiotic targets and the antibiotics that, that uh, work that way, for example, cell wall agents like beta-lactams, and the resistance mechanisms that we've also just talked about that will affect those antibiotics. This is not an exhaustive list, there are a huge number, um, but certainly within our beta-lactam antibiotics, which are the most frequently used class of antibiotics, it's in that inactivating enzymes that causes the biggest problem in terms of resistance. Next slide, please. It is important to recognize we've got different methods of resistance. Intrinsic, I've, I've mentioned already, which is where the organism will always be resistant, and this is encoded at a chromosomal level. But there are other forms of resistance, mutational through DNA replication errors, which can occur randomly. But then the one that we really worry about, which is that transferable resistance, which is also mutational, but is passed horizontally through different methods, conjugation, transformation, or transduction. Next slide, please. The World Health Organization produced in 2017 a bacterial priority pathogen list, and this is that list, of agents that have acquired resistance 
increasingly so perhaps to multiple antimicrobials, which is rendering them more and more difficult to treat. And they pose a significant risk to patients in terms of morbidity and most importantly, mortality. And it's important to be aware of those organisms and to know how to detect them in your laboratory by doing the right antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Now, of course, you may not see all of these resistant organisms in your own area. That's where knowing your epidemiology is essential. For example, we see very little carbapenem resistant acinetobacter in the United Kingdom, but we will still always test carbapenem susceptibility on those agents um, to, to look out for it because it's also an agent we would use in treatment. Next slide, please. And on that theme, I really want to highlight this if you haven't read it, which was a really groundbreaking piece of work published in The Lancet in um, 2022. And this was the first really in-depth analysis of the mortality toll caused by antimicrobial resistance. And this is something called the Graham Report, global deaths attributable to and associated with bacterial antimicrobial resistance. And hopefully what you will note on here, first of all, is that those top six pathogens causing death due to antimicrobial resistance are all pathogens who are on the World Health Organization priority pathogen list. It was quite striking, this piece of work, because it showed that nearly 5 million deaths worldwide were associated with antimicrobial resistance. And actually, when you looked at the numbers, there were about 1.2 million deaths, which they could say absolutely were attributed to bacterial antimicrobial resistance. And this was more deaths than there were due to HIV and AIDS, due to breast cancer, and due to malaria in the same year. So antimicrobial resistance is important and we need to ensure that within our laboratories, we are looking for it actively and detecting it. Next slide, please. So very finally, um, we're going to talk about how we take this information and how we help in the management of the patient. And this is a really, really nice figure that's used very often um, about how we use diagnostics to ensure appropriate treatment of our patients. And this all comes in uh, for us in microbiology as getting the right samples at the right time on the right patient and performing the right diagnostic tests. Using what we have available to us, and when we perform those tests, making sure we have the skill set and the knowledge to be able to interpret those results and to have timely feedback of those results to our clinical colleagues to ensure that the patient gets the right anti antibiotic at the right time. This improves patient outcome, but also can be used to ensure we're not overusing broad spectrum antibiotics. Next slide, please. So when we think about the process and getting those results, what we have to consider is how those results are relayed back to the right person to affect the necessary changes in therapy. So who's getting those results and how are we getting them and how quickly are we getting those results across? And that's looking at our own processes and what we can put in place. If you have an electronic reporting system, that's great. Results can go out very quickly, but then how do we know someone's actually seen those results and acted on them? Telephoning, we still do that, absolutely. Uh, phone people up, give them the result, can be difficult to get hold of. Paper copies mailed out takes time, it's not, so, it's not enough. But if you have a lot of samples, it's really about prioritizing which ones need to be um, alerted to colleagues and how we share that information. Next slide, please. Which also ties in with how we're interpreting those results. So it's not really enough just to say we've grown this. We also have to be able to say, do we think it's relevant? Do we think it's significant to that patient in the context of the clinical signs and symptoms and the diagnosis? Is the result right? Have we made any diagnostic errors here? Because errors can occur. Sometimes you can get a mixed growth. You look at the susceptibility pattern and immediately 
you know it's not right. Something's gone wrong at the laboratory level. Is it useful? Is the information we're providing going to make a material change to the patient? So let's have a look at how we might do that. Next slide, please. Oh yes, forgot, very key word, quality. Not just the quality of the processing and the result, it's the quality of the information we provide that makes the biggest difference to the patient. Next slide, please. So for example, here we are. This is um, a very poor knockup of a microbiology result for a midstream urine. We can see we've got a pyuria there, we've grown E. coli. We know that E. coli is the commonest cause of urinary tract infection. We provided some susceptibility results. So let's go through this. We want to be able to report antibiotics that one, the clinicians have access to, two, are included in the empirical treatment guidelines. And that's because those patients that we're treating may be on those drugs and we need to be able to tell the clinicians whether it's the right drug or not. So reporting resistance is just as important as reporting susceptibility. But we also want to use as narrow spectrum an agent as possible. So on here, ertapenem has been reported, but so has cephalexin. Ertapenem is very, very broad in its spectrum of cover, cephalexin much less so. So why would we want to report ertapenem, which is unnecessarily broad, has no advantage over, over using cephalexin for the treatment of a UTI? So that shouldn't have been reported. We have to release antibiotics that are appropriate for the clinical details. For example, if it's a simple urinary tract infection, report nitrofurantoin. If it's a pyelonephritis, nitrofurantoin doesn't penetrate into the kidney, so it's a completely inappropriate agent to give, so that shouldn't be reported. But alongside that, let's give comments to that effect. Let's make sure the clinicians know why we're reporting what we're reporting, what the thought process is. Ensure that we've got oral agents and IV agents if it's somebody who's in hospital. If they're an outpatient, oral options are really what we want to be reporting and alternative options for allergy. It does, of course, require clinical information. The quality of the results and the interpretation of those results that are provided by the laboratory fully depend on the quality of the information that we are getting at the point of the test request. So the more clinical information we have, the better the result and the better the interpretation we can give to help the patient. Next slide, please. So antibiotic stewardship and reporting results go hand in hand. Um, this is a, a snapshot from the World Health Organization antimicrobial uh, stewardship program practical toolkit. And the reporting of susceptibilities and sensitivities are hugely important to allow good outcomes for the patient, but also to reduce unnecessary broad spectrum antimicrobial use, which will select out for resistance if we don't reduce the use of those agents when it's not necessary to use them. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a paper that you may want to look up. It was an interesting bit of work that looked at prescribing based on results being provided by a microbiology laboratory. So sets of junior doctors given scenarios with reports that either had antimicrobial um, susceptibility results on or didn't. And what it found was that in a lot of cases, particularly in non-acute settings, if antimicrobial susceptibility results were not given, antibiotics were frequently not changed and in some cases not even prescribed. So for example, wound swabs uh, that were taken and actually there was no real concern about clinical infection. If antimicrobial results weren't given, junior doctor didn't prescribe. If they were, the junior doctors sort of thought it must be significant and would go down the route of prescribing. So. It's important to acknowledge the behaviour of uh, the trained behaviour of our clinicians. If we're giving a result and we're giving an interpretation and we give antimicrobials, that can be seen as us saying this is significant. Treat it, even if it may not be. So we have to think very carefully about what we release 
Next slide, please. So here are just a few examples, uh, leg wound swab, growth of Staphylococcus aureus. We all know that can be a significant skin and soft tissue pathogen. So we release antibiotics that would be used in the treatment that would be included in our treatment guidelines and for which we have availability for. So I've included antimicrobials that we use in our trust. I've also ensured that we've got IV and oral treatment options for if this is a patient in the hospital and given an alternative for penicillin allergy. Next slide, please. But then we have this circumstance where it's a wound swab, but it's really mixed. We've got lots of skin flora, we've got lots of coliforms. And what we know is that superficial swabs will pick up bacteria that may just be colonizing and may not be causing an infection. And the more mixed it is, the less likely these organisms are to be causing infection. And we know that most of the time coliforms are not in the top three pathogens for causing uh, your standard skin and soft tissue infection. So with this and based on the information given, I would not provide any further identification and I would not provide any further susceptibility results. And I would provide a comment to explain what my thinking is. And if the clinician has any concerns or questions about that, they can then call and we can have a discussion. Next slide, please. Still on the wound swabs, because this is a common one for us, I think. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the context of leg ulcers. So this too may be a colonizer, it may also be clinically significant. I have to base this in uh, my interpretation on the information that I've been given. Also looking back to see if we've had any past culture results. Is the patient in hospital? Are they not? Are they on antibiotics? Are they not? And if this is the first time we've isolated it from someone who's at home, who's otherwise reasonably well, I wouldn't provide any susceptibility results. But again, I would provide a comment to explain and to say, call me if you have any concerns. Next slide, please. However, if it's a patient who's in hospital, they're very unwell, I can see they've had antibiotic treatment in the community, this may be more significant. If they're diabetic, they certainly might be significant, and I will release the relevant susceptibility results. Next slide, please. Similar concept um, for sputum. Sputum is not sterile you're going to grow organisms that are in uh, the normal respiratory tract. But what we try to do in the lab is to encourage those that are clinically significant to grow through. And certainly for somebody who's got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Haemophilus influenza is a recognized pathogen. So it's reasonable to provide susceptibility results and to provide antibiotics that we know are commonly used to treat this sort of infection. So nothing broad spectrum, nothing like meropenem, it's not required. But if you've got a patient who's in hospital, who has a hospital acquired infection, maybe they're on the intensive care unit, growth of an organism such as Entrobacter may well be clinically significant. It might be a colonizer, and this is where we need to know a little bit more information and to produce relevant and timely antibiotics. So for example, gentamicin, not great for the chest, shouldn't release that. Tigacycline, we also don't really use, use for the chest, shouldn't release that. Release only appropriate antimicrobials for the site of infection and for the patient. Next slide, please. Lovely, I'm sorry, I've slightly run over, I apologize, Jean, who's now gonna take us through some case studies and I'm going to stop talking. Thanks for your attention. Hi again. Yes, I thought I would just uh, present a few case studies to illustrate the value of the lab in diagnosing and treating infections. So this is a 25 year old girl who presents with a cough and fevers for one week and she has green sputum. She had been given an antibiotic by a doctor, um, but she hasn't had any improvement in her symptoms. A chest x-ray shows in uh, consolidation. So there is definite pneumonia there. She is admitted and given keftriaxone and a sputum sample is sent. And quite surprisingly, I suppose the sputum actually shows some gram negative rods, um, which may not have been treated with the antibiotics she was on. She's failing to improve on keftriaxone. And we find in the lab that the sputum actually is growing an ESVL producing Klebsiella resistant to keftriaxone. But it is sensitive to ciprofloxacin. And once the antibiotic is changed to this, she improves. 
So this is an example of how microscopy and sensitivity results assisted in the management of this particular patient. And next slide, please. So the second patient is an 8 year old man with cancer who's admitted with fevers and flank pain, probably uh, pyelonephritis. Uh, the patient is again started on keftriaxone and a urine sample is sent. Uh, the patient had been an inpatient recently and interestingly had had a course of meropenem for a similar presentation. There's no improvement this time on keftriaxone, so the, treatments, the patient's treatment has escalated to meropenem, but in fact the urine sample has grown a very resistant E. coli, resistant in fact to meropenem, and the E. coli is producing a carbapenemase, which makes it resistant to most antibiotics tested. However, it is sensitive to amikacin, which is an aminoglycoside, so that antibiotic is prescribed and the patient makes a good response to amikacin. And then the third case is a 40-year-old man admitted with a two-week history of fevers, non-specific symptoms, no obvious source of infection. There's a slight rash you can see there on the right, his white cells are low. He's very, very unwell, very agitated. It's difficult to take blood cultures, but they are taken on the third attempt. He started on keftriaxone. And it's it just interestingly, the, the blood cultures were underfilled. The next day, gram positive cocci are seen in the blood in the gram stain of the blood. I think you can see them on the right there. They're identified as staph epidermidis of doubtful significance, probable contaminants. The patient continues on keftraxone with no improvement, is transferred to intensive care. But then it's noticed on the on the agar plates that the second colony is growing and a gram stain of these show gram negative rods, which are identified as salmonella typhi. So the patient actually has typhoid fever. And this particular strain is resistant to keftraxone, but sensitive to azithromycin. So that antibiotic is given instead. So I think these are three examples where the importance of sending specimens prior to starting antibiotics is really important. And then once the organism is known and the sensitivity pattern of the organism is known, the patient receives the correct um, antibiotic. Thanks very much. So I'll hand over to Nikki again. Thank you so much, much Jean and Louise. Um, I think we have some time now for a uh, panel discussion and some questions from um, the attendees. So if anyone has a question you'd like to ask any of us, please do raise your hand and then we can um, invite you to unmute yourselves. Thank you. Nikki, I don't know whether you want to pick up um, one of the chat questions actually now that we've got Jean and, and Louise um, not presenting. So somebody asked about using a combination of UCAST and um, the CLSI um, methodologies in labs. And what, what would your opinion be on that? Shall I take that one? Um... So people do, um, they certainly do, uh, even within my own laboratory, um, we we do have that, but I that's where I've seen some difficulties with it and I would probably caution against it. So for example, we, for everything that we do in terms of setting up our blood culture susceptibilities, whether that's disc sends or, or through other methods um, and our interpretation, we use UCAST. But one of the bits of kit that we have, which also does susceptibility testing for us, is the Vitec 2 automated system. And that for some types of organisms and some types of uh, bug drug combinations uses a mixture of UCAST and CLSI, which one is just confusing in terms of interpretation for people. And that can lead to error. Um, that can lead to significant confusion from individuals. Uh, and it's something that we're trying to sort out at the moment. Now, it may be that for some drug com drug bug combinations, there are only clinical breakpoints available in one or other of those guidelines. So CLSI, for example, does have breakpoints for some drug bugs that UCAST does not. Um, for example, 
we talk about acinetobacter, it's got a, a much more extensive susceptibility profile. Same for Burkholderia. UCAS doesn't have any breakpoint data for Burkholderia. So you may have circumstances based on the organism where you might need to mix. But in which case, you would need to be very, very clear so that people know exactly how they're interpreting those results and what they're looking at in order to interpret them. So I, I think avoid it where possible, but I recognize that there will be instances where you will need to mix and match a little bit. But it's just about clarity within the laboratory and with your clinicians. You know, some clinicians are very switched on to the fact that, you know, you use the breakpoints to interpret pharmacists, particularly interpret your dosing. So it needs to be quite clear what you're using so that people can interpret that information properly. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, I think you in the, in the UK we're encouraged to use UCAST a lot, and I think it's probably only when we come across a drug bug combination which is uncovered by UCAST that we start looking at CLSI and other options. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Stephen. Stephen, if you would like to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And um, I happen to work at the emergency uh, setup. One of the our problems has been managing very severe infections, especially when we have situations where you have to manage septic sepsis and then septic shock. And the challenge has been the issue about selecting the empirical antibiotic to manage these uh, conditions. However, we have always been having the challenge of taking sample before the treatment begins. What do you think would be the appropriate thing for uh, situations like this? And what do you think the pharmacist involvement will do to make sure that the protocol is followed uh, for an effective management of uh, patients, especially with septic shock and sepsis. Um, well, I start maybe the discussion on this one. I think, yeah, as you say, it's really important to get the specimens, if, if possible at all, before you start giving the antibiotic, particularly blood culture, I would say. You could probably leave some of the other samples until the patient has had one dose of antibiotics. Um, as regards choice of antibiotics, I suppose some of it is based on national protocols and some of it is based on local sensitivity data if that's available uh, because if you know that you've got a, a particular problem with antibiotic resistance then you may empirically go for some very broad spectrum antibiotic that you know is going to cover most of the expected organisms. Um, uh, obviously in the UK we're trying to sort of rein back on that and go narrow spectrum as much as we can, um, you know, depending on our sensitivity pattern. So we might need a com may use a combination of, for example, amoxicillin plus gentamicin, which locally will treat most of the expected pathogens. But if you are if you do have a lot of say ESBL bacteria or carbapenem resistance locally, then you may have to go for you know, a more broad spectrum, um, for example, a carbapenem or even a broader spectrum, one of the newer antibiotics to cover. I don't know, Louise, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, so two things, uh, obviously starting with the, the blood culture, can I just say we have similar problems. I think everybody has that, that trying to get the samples taken at the right time is a struggle and they can you know the reasons for that are variable aren't they and some of them may be very much situational um to what you've got available within your department i mean we've occasionally i've had sort of calls from people saying we don't have we don't have the sample uh, containers in the department what do we do you know th there are multiple reasons behind it isn't there and one of the things that i think is very useful is to try and address Find out from the people who are dealing with those patients day in, day out, what, what are the barriers? Um, what are the things that make that more difficult to maybe get that blood culture done in a timely way? There may be things that are easily identified that can 
then be modified that can be worked on to help bring about the effective change, which is getting the blood culture taken as soon as possible. Um, in cases where you've got somebody who's come in septic, of course, there are multiple different things that as that treating clinician you need to do. So you've got lots of competing things going on there. Um, and I would say, you know, if you have to get the first dose of the antibiotic in, great, but as quickly as possible afterwards, get that blood culture. You're not going to have killed off all your bacteria within five minutes of giving an antibiotic. So maybe it's about having that discussion and finding out what some of the barriers are and coming to an understanding, using a clear evidence base of, well, okay, what time is acceptable? What kind of time frame is acceptable to get those cultures done? Um, secondly, in terms of the empirical choice, we agree with, with Jean absolutely that this really depends on your local epidemiology. And, and I'm I'm so boring because I say this all the time. It's pretty much my answer to most things because we're all different and our situations are different. And what you see in your area may be very different from what I see in mine. And that's where the microbiology data that you use to treat patients you should also be using, and I'm sure that you are as best as you're able, I and mean, we're all trying to do that, aren't we? To get a picture of what you're seeing in your hospital, in your area, and you build that picture to see what the pathogens are, what your antimicrobial spectrum is. So um, in terms of your spectrum of, of cover and resistance, what are you seeing? And that will help you if you can do a cumulative antibiogram for some of your major pathogens, like your gram negatives, pull that together. And you can see if you've got a lot of resistance to one agent, we'll definitely don't use that empirically. But if you have a lot of susceptibility to another agent and you have access to that, because availability has been an issue globally. We've had lots of shortages of antibiotics. Um, in some settings, it's really difficult to get hold of certain antibiotics. So it's looking at what you have available, but what's going to cover the majority of the pathogens causing septic shock in your patient population? I hope that's a reasonably helpful question. Stephen, do you have anything that you want to pick up on there or come back with at all? Yeah, I think you have addressed most of the issues, uh, and I'm very grateful. Um, we believe we will change the things as you have actually some of the things you have suggested, and then we will look forward to a positive outcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dina, for your question. It was a really good one. So much. We've got just uh, three minutes left. So I don't know. We've had a question in the Q and A. I don't know if it, it, there's a quick answer to this, but I'm trying to use the disc reading template software Dioto, I think, to produce reading templates for our partner labs. Do you know of any more user friendly software or any that can produce PDFs, etc.? Any thoughts? That's a really good question, and. Despite the fact that we do use templates in our lab, I don't, I don't know which software. I think we put ours together ourselves. Or maybe I'm giving us too much credit that we did. But yeah, no, I don't. But um, I do think that's a really good point. The use of templates is, is great, particularly if you've got large volume samples and a lot coming through that you have to read very quickly rather than getting the calipers out. Um, is a really good idea. But no, Jean, are you aware of, of any? I'm afraid I'm a bit useless on that question. No, no we just uh, use just the calipers and just, you know, record things manually, you know, so it's quite old fashioned, really. But I think it would be a good idea to to have some sort of electronic way of, of uh, re reporting resistance. Obviously, with something like Phoenix, it's all it's all done for you already in the machine. It's sort of integrated. But with the uh, di the disk testing, um, I don't know of any system that's actually used. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, there are, if you've got automated systems um, like the WASP Copan, for example, or the Keystra, they they can, there are methods you can do it for you. But if in the lab you're, you're doing disk diffusion yourself without automated methods, I, I do think from a um, productivity and efficiency point of view, the templates are a really good way to do it. Um, I think we probably would just need to find out 
this is probably a question I can ask my lab manager um, what, what we use, because we do use them. We use them for a lot of our direct susceptibility testing from blood cultures. And it is it's a nice, quick way of doing it, which is also fairly standardized as well. There's a little bit of, of user interpretation, isn't there, uh, or limitation in it. But for doing lots of those tests quickly, if you don't have access to these automated readers, which a lot of people you know don't use. We don't use them here currently. Um, we just use templates. And I think that's a very good approach in the lab for distribution testing. So thank you so much. I think we'll have to wrap up there, bang on time. So um, that just leads me to say a big thank you to our speakers, Dr. Gina Driscoll and Dr. Louise Sweeney. Um, thank you to our CPA colleagues, uh, particularly Claire Brandish, who is our technical lead for the Microbiology Workstream, and our colleagues at VET and other affiliates, including Department of Health and Fleming Fund for their ongoing support for the CWPAMS programme. Um, thank you all for joining and also to Page Medical for tech support to facilitate these webinars. Um, our next webinar will be on One Health and Substandard Falsified Medicines in January, so please keep an eye out for the invitation and we hope to see you all there. Thanks so much. Commonwealth Pharmacists Association and the Tropical Health and Education Trust are pleased to announce the second round of grants for the Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship, CW Palms 2 program. Funded by the UK Department of Health and Social Care Fleming Fund, the program will run from April 2023 to December 2024 and aims to develop new partnerships as well as building on the success of established partners, encouraging sustainability and sharing of best practices through the development of in-country hubs. The projects are implemented by health partnerships between healthcare institutions in eight African countries, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia, and NHS and academic institutions in the UK. The increasing burden of MR calls for more efforts to address the challenge and its consequences. According to the Gram report released in 2022, 4.95 million deaths were associated with bacterial MR in 2019, and 1.27 million deaths were directly linked to bacterial MR. The CW PAMS program has proven effective in strengthening the capacity of the health workforce and institutions in Africa to address MR challenges and creating opportunities for bidirectional learning between institutions in the UK and Africa. Among other achievements, the program facilitated over 6,500 LMIC healthcare staffing and microbial stewardship and infection prevention and control between 2019 and 2022. The second phase, CWPAMS 2 aims to build on the success of the first phase. Working with 24 health partnerships, the program will focus on improving antimicrobial stewardship, including surveillance, building antimicrobial pharmacy expertise and capacity, enhancing infection prevention and control, improving the use of clinical microbiology and antimicrobial prescribing data to inform clinical decisions, enhancing the detection and reporting of sub substandard and falsified antimicrobial medicines, supporting community pharmacy. One of the ways we are doing this is by being in partnership with the Exchange Exchange, an organization building global health behavior science capacity by connecting health psychologists with health partnerships. We are exploring what behaviors are needed to change and what the drivers and barriers of these behaviors are. This partnership also assists with supporting intervention development to address these identified drivers and barriers and developing monitoring and evaluation tools to enable CWPAMS partnerships to understand what is changing why and how. To achieve this, 
we are excited to be supporting the delivery of a variety of projects, including supporting the development of antimicrobial stewardship network to share learning and building capacity in antimicrobial stewardship in Ghana. Malawi Wells Pharmacy Antimicrobial Stewardship Project, Kakamega Cambridge Health Partnership, Kakamega Country Center of Excellence in Antimicrobial Stewardship in Kenya. Strengthen MS activities and establish a hub for quality control of antimicrobial medications at University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, Ituko, Ozala, Enoko State, in Nigeria, Kampana, Cambridge, at Microbial Stewardship in Infection Prevention in Uganda, Strengthening MS at Ndola Teaching Hospital in Zambia, Strengthening Pharmacy Leadership for Microbial Stewardship in Sierra Leone. 